Now we've come to the line of division in this little epistle. It conforms to Paul's regular way of dividing. He always gives first the doctrinal section and then the practical section. And now he gives to us here the practical section. We have seen the preeminence of Christ in this first part. We've seen him as he is a member of the Trinity, that he's God. He's very man of very man, but he's very God of very God. And then he's preeminent in creation because he is the creator. And he is preeminent, as we have seen, in redemption. For he is the Redeemer. He's the one who gave himself for us. And he's preeminent in the church, for he gave himself for the church. Now we have come to the place where Paul is going to insist that he be made preeminent in our lives. Now, actually, we hear today a great deal about dedication. Well, what is dedication? Well, to put it in a definition that's very brief, dedication is Christ preeminent in our lives. Now, you can't just say, I'm a dedicated Christian. And then live as you please, as a great many are doing today. It means that if he is preeminent in your life, that you're going to live out that life down here. Because he has already said to us, as you know in this epistle, "...in him, that is, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness, the pleroma of the Godhead bodily." And you're complete. You're made full in him. You're ready for the voyage of life in him. In other words, Christ is really the solution to all the problems of life. And Paul took up, as we have seen here, all these different things that lead people from the person of Christ, like enticing words, carried away by oratory, our philosophy, our legal system, our mysticism, our asceticism. These are things that lead people away from the person of Christ. And very candidly, the Christian life is to live Christ out today. And he's going to talk about that now in this section here. And we'll find that in him is all that you and I will need. And now we see, therefore, Christ, the fullness of God, he's poured out into the life through the believers today. And that's the only way that he can be poured out. Now we have here in this first section, the thoughts and affections of believers are heavenly. And the thing that's important here is now the Scripture that we have. And I'd like to read first this very first verse. Colossians 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, the if here is not the if of condition. It's really the if of argument. And we've already seen that before in this epistle here. Paul, for instance, says, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled. That was way back in chapter 1, verse 23. Now, there was no question about they were continuing in the faith and grounded and settled, and they were not moved away from the hope of the gospel. The if there, again, is the if of argument, because actually these Colossian Christians, they had the evidence of their salvation. Now, what was the evidence? Well, it was faith and hope and love. The fruits of the Spirit were in their lives. Now, let's turn back and look at that for just a moment. In verse 4 of chapter 1, Paul said, "...since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus." The word had got around that they had a living faith in Christ Jesus, "...and of the love which ye have to all the saints." They love the believers. And that is the thing that is important today, love among the believers. And it's not this sentimental stuff today that you hear so much about. But you evidence your love, if you're a minister, if you give them the Word of God. And if you are a believer in the church, you evidence your love for your pastor, whether you support a Bible-teaching ministry or not. 
My friend, this thing is very practical. It gets right down where the rubber meets the road. And if it doesn't, it's no good at all. It's not just to come around and pat somebody on the back and say, I love you, and talk about it all the time. Love is that which manifests itself in reality, you see, so that they had faith and they had love. They also had hope. Will you notice we are told here as we move on down verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. And they had a hope, and that hope was the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ for his church. And these were the evidences of the fact that they were children of God. And this was the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 8, "...who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit." You see, it was a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the lives of these believers there in the city of Colossae. So that what we have here, again, is not a question or a condition, but of argument. Paul is saying, since you are risen, or since you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, here again is something that I think is very, very important. And I want you to notice now what he's saying here. He says, where is Christ today? Well, he's sitting on the right hand of God. What are we to do today? We're to seek those things which are above. And that word seek is a very interesting word, by the way. It actually means having an urgency and a desire and an ambition, having all of the excitement that goes with seeking those things which are above, where Christ sit it on the right hand of God. It was like in the Olympics. You see these folks running or doing some athletic feat to win a gold medal. Well, believe me, they were seeking it. I don't see many saints today looking for gold medals, but that's what we're to do. But where are we to seek them? Will we to seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God? The things above are what? Where Christ is. And it means to seek the things of Christ. Now, I want you to notice something here very important. He doesn't say here that we are to run off and take up some little course of mixture of pseudo-psychology and a smattering of Bible. He doesn't say that we just seek that. These things that are mixed up today and handed out, and these poor crippled Christians today are attempting to pick up this type of thing, and this pseudo-psychology and a little smattering of Bible is stirred up in a few night classes. And when you've taken that course, you have been given a solution to all the problems of life all the way from a neurotic mother-in-law to a boss that's a dirty old man. You just know how to treat everybody now when you've had this little course. You can solve all the problems of life. You've been given a do-it-yourself kit. And presto, while well, there's an open sesame to a new life. I say to you, and I say it very carefully, that you can only do it as you seek those things which are above where Christ is at the right hand of God. And friends, you can't find it in a tape either. Now, I'm beginning to step on toes. In fact, my own toes. A couple came to me in the summer conference says, Dr. McGee, we have a certain tape of yours. We play that tape at least once every week. Listen to it. Well, I had a feeling that they were beginning to worship a man and that tape wasn't getting them through to Christ. And friends, it'd be better if they'd burn that tape if it doesn't get them through to Christ. And now I'm really going to step on toes. He didn't say here to seek out and listen to a radio program. May I say this to you, and may I say it kindly, and may I say it very frankly today. Not many will be quite as frank as I am, as you well know. Don't make McGee your idol. If you do, you have one that has feet of clay. You are looking to a man that's just like you are, a person just like you are. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm not near the man I'd like to be. 
Not the husband I'd like to be, not the father, and I'm not even the grandfather I'd like to be. May I say it to you, don't make the through the Bible program a God for you. My friend, the purpose of this program and the purpose of this poor preacher is to get through the Word of God to you so that you can see the living Christ and get through to Him. And friends, if the Holy Spirit just doesn't use this to get you through to the living Christ, And we've miserably, we've fallen on our face, and I'm really willing to quit. Now, the Bible, and I believe this with all of my heart, is a book which reveals the living Christ. I'd like to illustrate that. I was in school with a fellow. He was a Canadian. He told me about his first trip down to Niagara Falls. And by the way, Ms. McGee and I, we had the opportunity of seeing Niagara Falls for the first time for each one of us. And I said to her when we were there looking over the falls and that mighty cascade of water, I said to her, honey, I said, I promised you that on our honeymoon we'd go to Niagara Falls. I think we're still on our honeymoon. And I said, here we are. So we got to see it. But this young fellow told me that as a boy, young boy, he got on the train and he went down from the Canadian side, of course, and that's the best place to see it. I found that out. And he says that when I got off the train, I could hear the roar of the falls, but I couldn't see them. So I began to move toward the sound, and I came to a great big building. I went in that building, and it was like a union station in the United States. There was the popcorn vendor. There was the soda pop machine, the gift shop, and all kinds of things around, and all kinds of papers and chewing gum papers on the floor, and I guess chewing gum too, and people sitting around. And he said, I was a little disappointed, but I could hear the roar of the falls. Then I looked down at the end of the building, and I saw the biggest picture I'd ever seen in my life, a great big frame that took in most of the end of that building. And he says, it was a picture of Niagara Falls. And he said, I couldn't believe it. At Niagara Falls, they'd have a picture of Niagara Falls. So he said, I began to walk down toward that picture. And the closer I got to it, I saw that I was looking through a frame at the real, living, running falls. May I say to you, friends, when you read the Bible, you're not looking at a dead person. You're looking at the real, living Christ. He's living. He's at God's right hand. And we have seek the things which are above. We have seek Him today. And that's the reason we're going through the Bible. And there's no shortcut to this. Somebody said to me, well, why not cut it down to one year? I've tried that. I did that for several years. It's not adequate. Five years is really not adequate because some people are already writing in and says, why don't you slow down? Well, friends, we're taking five years, and now somebody says ten years. Oh, no, I can't do that. This is not a short course, and it's actually longer than any college course. And I can't go ten years. That's out for me. Five years is long enough. And even if we went through 10 years, 20 years, we'd not know it all. Well, when Paul came to the end of his life, he could say that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, today, friends, that you and I might seek those things which are above. And that's the purpose of this program here. And how well are we doing it? Well, some people are getting through. I'm going to pick up now just a couple of letters here and share them with you. Here is one that the listener writes. When we were studying Romans and Corinthians, I began to realize just how much of a carnal Christian I really was. And I began to desire much more than that. So I began to pray that I might truly know Christ as God would want me to. Nothing happened for a while. But I kept praying. And then God did answer my prayer. One day you said that God sees us in Christ. And it was as though some dark, hidden thing had been brought out into the light. I'd read Ephesians many times before, but that day your message really struck home. It's a wonderful thing to know that Paul's prayer is still being answered today. And I realized that day 
that God no longer looked down upon me as a poor sinner struggling upon this earth, but in Christ, and I belong to him as a child. I wish I could read the rest of that letter. My friend, that's what we want to do. Will you listen to this one here? And I probably should tell you where this one comes from. It comes from Reedley, California. And then here is one that comes from Fountain Valley, California. And this listener writes, I'm not going to rave on about, Oh, Dr. McGee, I don't know what I'd do without you, but must testify to the real fact that your faithful holding forth of the word of life has sustained me through some very difficult things and always brings me back to where God can and does show himself to be a loving father who cares about me and each one of my children that are his children. When I wrote you a year ago about regaining my spiritual equilibrium during your study in Romans, I thought things had gotten as bad as they possibly could, and the worst was over. Well, I know now that God was strengthening me then to endure what has come since. And through it all, there was good old Dr. McGee, God's spokesman, faithfully declaring the whole counsel of God daily. And sometimes in desperation, I'd listen two and three times a day as all else around me crumbled and deteriorated. My friend, may I say to you, and I say it from my heart, oh, get through to Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitted, the right hand of God. And I'd give up and quit if there weren't some people getting through to him, let me tell you, because that's the purpose of this program, and that ought to be the purpose of every program. And anything that's done for God, that it gets people through to God. Now, will you notice, he says, set your affection. Actually, the word here is mine. Think about the things that are above. You remember Paul said that if there's anything that's good and pure, think on these things. And that's Christ, by the way. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. How are you going to get along with your mother-in-law is important. But my friend, you're going to get along with your mother-in-law, or you're not going to get along with her. Maybe you can get along with her. The important thing is for you to get through to Christ. That ought to come above everything else. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead. And I'd like to change that, because here it's, For ye have died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, when we read here that you have died, when did you die? Same thing that, We've had before in Galatians, I'm crucified with Christ. When were you? 1,900 years ago. He took my place. He took your place. He died in your room, in my room, and we died in him. And therefore, ye have died in Christ, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, I was taken out of the old Adam by baptism, That is, the Holy Spirit. He took me out and put me in Christ. And as this letter I read, it's opened up a new world for this man. You're now in Christ. And now that you're in Christ, you should live his life out. Let his fullness be lived out through you. When Christ, who is our life... Now, if you have any life, it's Christ. John says, we're going to show unto you eternal life. Well, how can you show eternal life? He's going to show them Christ. Christ is eternal life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And some of these days we're going to appear with him in glory. Now, we are going to see that this relates to two things in our lives. First of all, to personal holiness, and then to our fellowship with others that are round about us. Now, this matter of holiness is something that most Christians are frightened of today. Many years ago, when I was a young preacher, I heard the late Bishop Moore of the old Southern Methodist Church make this statement. He says, If Methodists were as afraid of sin as they are of holiness, it would be a wonderful thing. Well, may I say it doesn't only apply to Methodists, but it applies to most Christians today. 
They just don't like this term holiness. It's a very good word, by the way. And that's actually what Paul's talking about. Now, we're to go directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's alive today. And you won't find him in Bethlehem today, friends. If you're thinking about a little baby, you're thinking wrong. He's up yonder at God's right hand, right at this very moment. He's on a throne, not in a cradle and not in an inn, but in heaven itself. And he's there for you and me today. Now, if you are in Christ, if you've accepted him as your Savior, it's going to tell in your life down here. And friends, if it doesn't tell in your life down here, maybe you're not in him up yonder. And the important thing now is to see, he says here in verse 5, mortify, and that means to put in the place of death. You count on it. That when he died 1,900 years ago, you died. Therefore, when you have a member of your body that's offending you, is it your eye? Is it today covetousness? For he mentions specifically now a great many of these sins. Is it sex? These are the things that get right down to where you and I walk today, right down where the rubber meets the road, right down on the sidewalks, not only in New York, but the sidewalks of your town and my town today. He says, therefore, mortify the members which we have here in these bodies of ours. These bodies are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, and they're to be used for God, and therefore, fornication. And these are still dirty words in my book. And that, I think, refers to both physical and spiritual fornication and uncleanness. That includes thoughts, words, looks, gestures, and the jokes you tell. And inordinate affection, that's lust, by the way. And evil concupiscence, and there's a good one for you. That means evil desire you have in your heart. Evil desire. Well, put that thing to death, friend and covetousness, and that means we must have mourness, and that's idolatry. Now, this morning, as I came down to the radio, there were a great many people that were on the way to work, and up above where I live, there are many professional men, many men that are executives, and my one man went by me in a Cadillac. He didn't see me or anybody else. He's in a hurry. You know why? We'd see pictures of heathen going to temples over in the Orient and in benighted countries, and we feel sorry for them. We say, my, isn't that terrible? That poor fellow over yonder's in darkness, and he's going in to worship an idol and bow before it. This fellow in the Cadillac, too, was on the way down to worship his idol, and his idol is the almighty dollar. And he's going to see how much that he's going to make. And there are great many folk today that are overcome by this matter of covetousness, and they covet material things of this world. They want more money. The root of most of our problems in this country today is covetousness. And the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not. It can be used for the glory of God for that matter. And as one man said to me, he says, I'm working today, and I'm working for God. I've already made mine. A man down in Florida, I've known him over a period now of about 10 years, and I was out when I first met him on his boat. We went out in the bay and had lunch together. Lovely person. And as he talked, he's in his 40s at that time. He's in his 50s now. But he was in his 40s, and he's already retired. And he very frankly said, he said, well, I made a million dollars, and if I made two million, I'd have to give most of it to the government anyway. And therefore, he said, I decided I'd retire. And now what I make, he says, I'm putting it in the Lord's work. That's the thing that he was doing. How wonderful. He certainly is not overcome with covetousness. But how many men today, even Christians, working on that second million, and they don't need it because they worship an idol. And that is something that indicates... My friend, you're not in Christ. If you're in Christ, that must come first. And you must seek the things which are above. Now, we have here in verse 6, "...for which things sake..." That is, because the world does these things, 
the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Now, men are not lost simply because they do these things, and they are not lost because they haven't heard of Christ. Men are lost because they're sinners, sinners in their hearts. And because they're sinners, they do these things. Now, we did these things once, and I hope that's a true statement of us. I hope we're not still doing them, because he says, "...in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them." This was the thing that occupied the mind of this man that made a million dollars. He very frankly said, I worship that almighty dollar, and I wanted to get the next one, and I was after the next one. But after he came to Christ, he decided he'd spend a little time in seeking the things of Christ. Oh, my friend, do we put him first? And are we today engaged in the very things the world's engaged in, and God intends to judge them for it? Well, how shall we escape the judgment of God? Well, somebody says, I'm in Christ. Well, if you're in Christ, then seek the things which are above, and you won't be doing these things. Now, will you notice, verse 8, "...but now ye also put off all these..." Now, he speaks, and this is, I think, quite interesting through this section here. These are habits that we put off as a garment. And after all, a garment is a habit, is it not? A great many folk today, they have a riding habit, and they have a golf habit. I have an old pair of slacks that I play golf in. That's my golfing habit. I don't look very good, but that's the habit that I wear. And different people have different habits that they wear. Well, that's what he's talking about here. Put off these old things as you'd put off a dirty, filthy garment. And you don't send it to the laundry. You throw it away. You put it in the garbage can. You put off all these. Now, what are these things that you're to put off? Anger. I think we have here an increase of this. From anger comes the next one, by the way, wrath. Some people get angry and get over it in just a few minutes. The Lord Jesus, you remember, he was angry at the Pharisees because of the hardness of their hearts. And anger is not sinful in and of itself. But when anger turns, and we're angry at the wrong things, of course, but when it turns to wrath, that is when we develop an unforgiving spirit, And then the third one is malice. And someone has said malice is congealed anger. Well, that's what it is. Oh, there's some that not only do they nurse it, but they're going to try to get even. And there are Christians that do that. And may I say to you, he says you put that off as an old, dirty, filthy garment. You couldn't represent Christ with that. Now you have blasphemy here. And I think blasphemy actually can be a... Two kinds. You blaspheme against God, and you can blaspheme against man, by the way. Now, blasphemy is to defame the name of God. It doesn't mean just necessarily to take his name in vain, but it's to misrepresent him. It's to hate him. I have a letter from a lady. I think I shared that with you. No, I haven't shared that letter. I probably ought to. She says about how God took her little three-year-old child. And she hated God because of it. And somebody gave her our little book, The Death of a Little Child, and it brought her to the Lord. She realized that she'd only been a church member before that, hadn't really been a member. And you blaspheme God, friends. But did you know you can blaspheme individuals? Christian friend, when you make a statement about a Christian that's not true, some statement, I know years ago, Way back in the old days, a man made a statement concerning a certain preacher. He was Arminian in his theology. And although I'm a Calvinist, I certainly would never make the statement concerning a man that he did. He says that he is of Satan. Well, when you do that, you blaspheme a man who's a Christian. And when you say things that are not true or things like that about a child of God, Friend, you're blaspheming. You're guilty of blaspheming. And so you have different kinds of blaspheming. Then filthy communication out of your mouth. And I can't believe that Christians indulge in that. 
But I'm told today that there's certain little groups that meet together. They share dirty jokes. And I understand that there's some that use swear words. In fact, I've heard of certain Christian leaders that do that. I do not believe that you can be a child of God today, friends, and live like this. These are things that are to be put off. Then notice this, lie not one to another. Now, who is he talking about now? Believers, because he says, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. Is it possible for a Christian to lie? Certainly is. And that doesn't mean you lose your salvation when you do. If it did, many of us would have lost ours a long time ago. Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. And it also reveals that you don't reach the place of perfection, my friend, nor do you get rid of the old nature when you become a child of God, because you can still lie. And I believe that that's probably the first thing that a child does, is lie. I heard the story about the little boy. He came running in the house, and he says, Mama, Mama, a lion just ran across our front lawn. And she says, Willie, you know that was not a lion. That was a big dog that ran across. He says, you go upstairs and confess to the Lord and tell him that you lied about that, that that was not a lion, but it was a big dog. So little Willie went upstairs, and he came down a little while, and so his mama said to him, did you confess to the Lord? And he says, I did. Did you tell him that you lied about that dog that was a lion? It was not a lion. And he said, yes, I did. But he says, you know, the Lord said when he first saw him, he thought he was a lion too. May I say to you, that's the first thing we start out with. And that is something that is deep-rooted in the human heart. And how many Christians today indulge in that? Lie not one to another, seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. Now, he says, and you put on the new man. Now, this is quite wonderful here. You take off one garment, and you put on a new garment and a new habit. And by the way, this is good psychology here. You and I, the old nature, controlled us so long that we set up certain things called habits. And that's the reason that a garment's a good term here. It's a habit. That means that we do things a certain way, say certain things, because you and I are made up of a whole nervous system. I put my hand down on a red-hot stove, you see, and there goes through a set of neurons, axons, and dendrites, a message to the brain. It's switched over to the motor neurons, and a word goes down to the finger, and it says, say, you crazy fool, take your finger off that red-hot stove, you're getting burned, and you jerk it off. Of course, that happens quicker than you can tell it. You put your finger there in a minute, but that's what took place. Now, you have certain habits set up. Take off those habits and form new habits. And it's true psychologically that you can. And it's especially true because you have the Holy Spirit, my friend. Therefore, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, this is quite wonderful. You put on a new man, and that new man is Christ. That's the church today. Renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And the church today is to represent him down here. And in that church of believers, there's neither Greek nor Jew. That was a religious division in that day. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. That's also a religious division but also barbarian and Scythian. Now, believe me, barbarians were those that were not Greeks. They were those people that we call today the heathen. But the Scythian was the worst kind of a barbarian. Scythia is north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And these people that lived there were probably the worst barbarians that have ever been on this earth. You talk about pagan Heathen, 
brutal and mean. You know, they would take their enemies and scalp them, and then they would use the skull as a cup and take their blood and drink the blood of their victims out of the skull. I can't think of becoming more heathen than that, my friend. And did you know that many of us today with a white skin, that our ancestors came through that territory there? In fact, we're called Caucasians. You know why? Because that is the area out of which they came. Barbarians. But even in that day, they were being led to Christ. Paul mentions that here. Believe me, the gospel, even in Paul's day, had reached out. And it had done a tremendous work in this area where the church of Colossae was. And already missionaries had gone north. And they'd gone beyond the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And Scythians had been won for Jesus Christ in that day. But even as barbarian as they were, all brought in one body, we're now one in Christ. And Christ is all, and he's in all. You just can't have it any more wonderful than that, my friend. This is something that is beyond description. He labeled the things of the old man that were to be put off. Now, friends, we're in this section of Colossians. That's the practical section. We have seen that Christ is the head of the church, and we are complete in him. We're made full in him, and all we need we'll find in Christ. You won't find it in the systems that men have down here. You won't find it in legalism or philosophy or some little man-made system. If we're risen with Christ, we're to seek the things that are above, where Christ is at the right hand of God. Now, we've seen that that will lead to personal holiness, and we have talked already about that. Then we have seen that it will reveal a holiness in our lives in relationship to those that are about us. And that is where we've come just now at verse 12. And then as we move on, we're going to see not only the personal holiness and holiness in our relationship to others, but we'll see from verses 18 to 21, holiness in the home. And then from verse 22 to 25, holiness on the job. You see, this gets right down to where we live. It's wonderful to seek the things which are above and think that we're living above the smog of this world. But friend, you and I have got feet that reach right down to walk in the home, walk on the job, walk in a social relationship, and we're to live out the fullness of Christ. And that is the Christian life, by the way. It's not following some little legal system or following some little system today. And I don't care how good the system might be. It's only as you and I live out the life of Christ. Now, he says here, he talked about what we're to put off as a garment, as a habit. And now he's going to tell us what we're to put on. And actually, we have in this section here what the well-dressed Christian is going to be wearing. In fact, I have a message with that title what the well-dressed Christian will wear. And it deals with this section here. Now, will you notice what we're to put on? I begin at verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, and we are to be holy in our living, bowels of mercy. Now, I think the better translation of that is a heart of compassion. Now, you will notice that these things that he's going to mention here are actually the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot produce them in our lives. And the minute when you and I begin to think about the wonderful position that we have in Christ and the high calling that we have today, and we recognize as we look at ourselves that we're impotent, that we're powerless, that we're weak, we'll not be able to attain to it at all. And that was the position, you remember, the bride in the Song of Solomon. She knew the kiss of peace, that peace had been made with God. And how wonderful it is that he's kissed us, friends, and told us 
our sins are forgiven us in Christ. And then when we sin as a child of God, you remember when that boy that got away from the father's home and he came home, the father saw him and ran and fell on his neck. And what did he do? He kissed him. And it's the kiss of pardon, the kiss of forgiveness that God gives. And that wonderful position, the bride then says in the Song of Solomon, draw me, draw me. I'm not able to attain to this wonderful position that I have, and we can't do it ourselves. We find ourselves cast upon him. And here is where the Spirit of God comes in. And here's where we're told, walk in the Spirit. And we're to walk in the Spirit now. And these are the things that are to be in our lives. And we are to have here a heart of compassion. Oh, how heartless this world is today. How indifferent it is. And how mechanical it has become. I find I'm a number today. And I'm not only a number to a corporation, I don't have anything to do with several corporations. The computer does business with me, a machine. I can't tell that machine how I feel. I can't tell that machine when it made a mistake. I can't tell a machine when I made a mistake. I just do business with it. It sends me my bill, and I pay it, and that's it. I do business with a bank, and it's got a heart as big as a computer, in fact, that computer's the heart. And I do business today. Very frankly, I had to go to a doctor. He wasn't my doctor, but in an emergency. And I found out all I was was just a boy that had a tummy ache. And I wasn't a person at all as far as he's concerned. He just talked about these big medical terms. And I'm not that. But a Christian, my friend, we should have a heart of compassion for those that are around us and our relationship to others, a heart of compassion. And then he says something else here, that there should be kindness. And let's just look at these words just for a moment. Actually, the word kindness is a word that Paul used. It really means profitable. That's a strange way, but it means to be helpful to others. And this word, there's another word for it also, but this word has in it the note of gentleness. Now, the other word has the note of being stern. You can be kind and still be stern. When I tell my little grandson, you don't do that, may I say to you, I mean it. And I try to be stern with it, but there are times when I am gentle also. And that's the word here. This is kindness. And humbleness, that is the word actually meekness. And as we've said before, as we've been over these words, it doesn't mean weakness. It means something far more than that. And then you'll notice that it's humbleness of mind. And then there's meekness, and that has to do with the meek spirit. And then long-suffering, and that's a very interesting word. That word here is macrothumion, and that means long-burning. means it burns a long time. We shouldn't have a short fuse with our friends and our Christian brethren. We shouldn't make snap judgments. And then forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel, here that is a complaint is what it is, and a cause of blame, you really have justification against any. Even what are you to do if any man have a quarrel against any? Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Now, that doesn't mean that we become a doormat, but it does mean that when we have a complaint, we're to go to the individual and try to work the matter out. And there are great many that you can't, of course. Our Lord denounced the Pharisees, and there was no thought there, any thought at all of forgiveness. He just denounced them. And there are people that you and I just can't get along with. We have to face that. But we are to forgive one another, even as Christ forgave us. And the thought here is that he's forgiven us so much that it won't hurt us to forgive somebody that stepped on our toes. 
And he says, and above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And that's a wonderful thing. Put on love. You see, you have here two fruits of the Spirit. Love, and then verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And the word here is actually be umpire in your heart, or even better still, let it be at home in your heart. That is, have the run of the house. You know, there are a great many people today that are great on doctrine and want to be fundamental in the faith, and that's all important. I don't think anyone emphasizes that more than I do. But they are great at even praising Bible study. But they don't ever can Bible study. They know so little about the Word of God. Now he says, let the Word of Christ, and that's a peculiar expression of Paul. He says here, let the Word of Christ, and the Lord Jesus said, you're clean through the Word which I've spoken unto you. And the best Saturday bath that you can take is to study the Word of God. And the Word of Christ, dwell in you. Be at home. Have the run of the house. Be familiar with it. The Bible is a strange book to a great many people. It actually almost frightens them to see one of them. May I say to you that we ought to be familiar with it. And let the peace of God have the run in your heart to the which also you're called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Be an umpire. Then let the word of God, or the word of Christ, and we should keep it like that, dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Let it be at home. Know it. Be familiar with the word of Christ and study it. And know what he's saying to you today. For here's where he's going to speak to you, friends, is in his word. And then teaching and admonishing one another. In what? In psalms and hymns and spiritual song. Singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. And I love that because it's singing in your heart. Because it never gets out beyond that as far as I'm concerned. But we are to let this have a marvelous influence, you see, in our lives. And he says, "...whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him." And whatsoever you do. Now, you want a norm for Christian conduct? Do you want a standard today to go by? Do you want a principle and not a lot of little rules? Here's the principle for Christian living. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, now he doesn't tell you what to do, he just says, whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> My friend, are you able, whatever you do, whatever your job is, whatever you do in the home, Whatever you do in your relationship to others, in your social life, can you say, I'm doing this in the name of the Lord Jesus? Now, if you can do that, then you go ahead and do it, whatever it is. If you can do it in his name, this is a marvelous standard. This is a yardstick to put out on your life. Now, we come here to the home. And if you'll notice that he's dealing here with the same things that he dealt with, in the epistle to the Ephesians, when he said, Be filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he gave these same instructions. Now, he says here, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, knowledge. Now, friends, what does it mean now to be filled with the Holy Spirit? You'll have to be filled with the word of Christ also. It'll have to dwell in you richly, and when it dwells in you richly, then it is inspired by the Spirit of God. Then you're filled with the Spirit of God. I do not believe that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. I do not believe that you can serve Christ until you're filled with the knowledge of his Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Now it will work itself out in your lives. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as it is fit in the Lord. 
Now, we've been over this in Ephesians, and I have a book on Ephesians, and it would still be available to those who send in a gift. But wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, this is for the purpose of order in the home. This is for the purpose of a browbeating husband, and I do not believe that God intends a wife to submit herself if she's saved to an unsaved husband who attempts to order her around and even beat her. A woman wrote in to us and said that her husband beat her. He was unsaved. When he got drunk, he beat her. But she felt as a Christian she ought to stay with him. You know what I said to her? I said, you leave him. (laughs) That's what God wants you to do. God's never asked any woman to stay with a drunken husband. Of course not. She destroys her own personality. She destroys her own dignity. And she'll find herself being brought down to his level if she takes that. But this is to submit yourselves to your own husband as is fit in the Lord. And it's as it's fit in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And this is the husband that loves his wife that she's to submit to. And it means that she is not to be the one to take the lead, but to urge him to take the lead. And I think we've had this thing all wrong for so long. And even today, I've taken out, and in fact, my entire ministry, the word obey. I don't think it belongs in the marriage ceremony at all. Now, it does belong here. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now, friends, this is children, obey your parents. And this doesn't mean a 24-year-old boy walking around tied to his mama's apron string. Whether he's married or not married, he's reached the place that he's to get away from his parents. And my feeling is that today, when you see a child beginning to to rebel, these 18-year-olds rebel against their parents. I'm not sure but what God's put that in their heart, to get away. It's time they're being weaned and to get away. And yet, today I've been sent some literature put out by an organization now that's telling why even a young married couple that they're to go and obey their parents. What nonsense and how unscriptural that is. This is for children. This is for minors. Now, we are told, verse 21, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Now we come to the relationship on the job. This is the relationship of capital and labor. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, and eye service as Paul's peculiar word here. He's used it before. What he means is don't keep your eye on the clock. Keep your eye on Christ. He's the one that you're serving. And that's the way you ought to do your job. Today, we've got a lot of Christians that are talking about they're dedicated and they want to serve the Lord. And they're as lazy as they possibly can be. We've had a little experience in radio. We had a boy here that talked about how dedicated he was. He stood around with his hands in his pocket and his mouth going all the time. He thought he was dedicated. My friend, if you are lazy on the job, may I say to you very frankly, you are not dedicated to Jesus Christ. He wants you to do a good job. But in singleness of heart, fear in God. And you remember you had some instructions for also the man that employs him too, that he has a responsibility as a Christian. This is the simplicity of a Christian's life. Paul could reduce his life down to just one goal. The one thing had top priority in his life. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth for those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, he had his eye and his mind, and his heart, and his total affections fixed upon Jesus Christ. Now, that reduces life down to the lowest common denominator, 
and gives us the highest answer that you can get. And, of course, that answer is Christ himself. And here, the idea is not to fear the boss, but to fear God. And he concludes with that, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Well, the word heartily here, that is work from your soul. We hear a great deal today about a soul brother, but we ought to have a little more soul work. That is, that whatever we do, we're doing it to the Lord, not to man, not to be man-pleasers. And he goes on to say, "...knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ." Now, that simply means that you're not going to have to report to your boss, maybe. When his back is turned, he doesn't see that you're loafing on the job. He doesn't see that you're not really giving him a full day's work. But the Lord Jesus does. And you're going to answer to him because, see, you are in him and you belong to him. And therefore, you have to give an account of your life to him. And since we represent him down here upon the earth, He's going to ask that his representative be found faithful, you see, knowing that of the Lord. And I'm of the opinion that a great many folk, humble people that you and I know nothing about today, who've been faithful, faithful on the job, faithful to their employer, faithful to their church, faithful to their pastor. And very few people know about them. They're going to get a reward. And I think you and I are going to be surprised someday when we see what a handsome reward they're going to get, a reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now, that just puts a different complexion upon Christian service down here. There's so many today that are lazy in God's work. I would say that one of the curses of the ministry, and I find this has been true of a staff, it's been so easy for them to loaf on the job. Nobody looking, nobody watching. But we serve the Lord Christ. We're going to give an account to him. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there's no respect of persons. And just because you happen to be in God's service and you feel like that you're maybe something special because you're teaching a Sunday school class, when he judges you, friend, That won't make any difference at all. All will be judged alike. And we're talking now about believers that go before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in chapter 4, verse 1, I come down to this verse here. He says, Masters, now, not only the servant, but the master. Master, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. And equal here means to not level down, but to level up. It means that you're to do right by them, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven, and you're going to stand before Christ someday. Every Christian employer, as well as employee, will stand before God. And by the way, this does put the gospel in shoe leather, does it not? And it gets right down where the rubber meets the road. And by the way, it gets right down where your foot is walking in the factory and in the office, or whatever you're doing, you're to do it unto the Lord because you're going to answer to him if you're his child. What a tremendous statement this is. Now he goes on to say here, "...continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving." Continue in prayer here. And this is real prayer that he's talking about. And watch. These two words are put together here. And they are very important. Watch and pray. And you remember the experience of Nehemiah in this connection. You remember that the thing that he did was when the enemy tried to stop him from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, he just didn't throw in the towel and cry out that he couldn't do the job. Nor did he just say, well, we'll make it a matter of prayer and just continue as he was. This is what Nehemiah said he did. He says, we made our prayer and we set a watch. (laughs) And right here, Paul says, watch and pray. The old preacher down years ago in Georgia, I was trying to recall his name, and I can't think of it, but 
years ago down in Georgia, he used to make this statement. He says, when a farmer prays for a corn crop, God expects him to say, Amen, with a hole. And if you're praying about something, then you need to get busy about it. And you have that same thing today, a lot of pious nonsense. I got a letter from a preacher. He said, I've been to Mayo Clinic. I went there, and they found out I have cancer, and they recommend an operation. But he says, I've come home, and I've decided I'm going to do like you did, just trust the Lord. Well, I sat down and wrote him a letter in a hurry. I said, brother, I didn't just trust the Lord. I went to what I think is the finest cancer specialist out here on the West Coast. And I know that my case was brought up before the UCLA Medical Clinic and was discussed there. And they recommended the best thing that medical science knew to do. And I wrote him and I said, they did all that. And I said, I've had two operations for cancer. Now, I said, let me say this to you, brother. If you want to be an intelligent Christian, I think you are, then you get down to male brothers as quickly as you can. Tell them to operate. That's what they want to do. Then I says, you trust the Lord that he'll bring you through it. Now, I said, that's what I did. That's watch and pray, watch and pray, be on the job. That's what Paul... My, this is so practical. It's very practical. Now, he says, he continues here, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And be sure and thank God always, as we have said back in Ephesians, thank him because he's going to hear and answer your prayer. Oh, maybe not the way you prayed, but he'll answer. With all praying also for us. Paul says, don't forget us. And I'd like to add that right here too. Don't forget us. And you can't help Paul any longer by praying for him, but you can help our radio ministry and you can help your pastor with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm also in bonds. And Paul was in prison, but he said, I want to be released, and I want to go out through an open door that I might preach the gospel. And I consider every radio station, we have a door. And I ask God, keep the doors open. He promised he would. That's our verse, you remember, in Revelation. He says, I've set before you an open door. And he set before us a lot of open doors. But we ask him to open some more, too, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now he says here, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Now the child of God has a responsibility before the world today. Walk in wisdom. Don't be foolish as a child of God. And I repeat this. There's so much pious nonsense today. We have no right, especially before an unsaved world, to make foolish statements and to say that we're trusting the Lord when we're really not trusting Him. Or to do foolish things, not going to the doctor when we should go to the doctor. I tell you, there's a woman right here in Southern California who wrote me a letter. She rebuked me for going to the doctor, not trusting the Lord. That's the way she put it. I trusted the Lord. But she says, I have cancer, and I'm trusting the Lord, and I don't go to a doctor. I don't guess I need tell you that they buried her not too long ago, and she died of cancer. And the neighbors, I understand, they smile. They said, this Christianity is foolish sort of thing, isn't it? Oh, my friend, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And that means buying up the opportunities. When you see an opportunity, now, you don't force yourself on people, but pray that the Lord leads you. And I wish I had time to tell you today about how the Lord, not only in my life, but so many others that I could tell you about how they just prayed and asked him to open the door, and he opened the door. But let him open the door before you and I make the mistake of putting our foot in our mouth. I've knocked on a door many a time as a pastor and stepped in and put my foot in my mouth the very first thing. And I did that so much that I decided I'd do lots more praying about it because we can make a mistake. He says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And a great many people think, let your speech be salt. They really sting you with, you know, little sarcastic remarks. 
but it means always with grace, seasoned with salt. In other words, a child of God should have a conversation that deters evil, not promotes it, should withhold it, you see. And I think it also has in it the idea, don't be boring as a Christian. Oh, the Lord forgive us for being boring as Christians. We ought to be excited about all this, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now, we come to a list here that's remarkable, beginning at verse 7 of chapter 4 of Colossians. What we have here is a list of names of people that Paul knew, and they are men and women that lived back there in the first century. They walked down Roman roads, lived in Roman cities. They were under Roman rule. They were in the midst of paganism, but they were God's children. And many of these were in Ephesus. And when I was there, I climbed up in that theater there and sat down high up. And I looked down that great marble boulevard, harbor boulevard's what it is. Leads right down to where the harbor was in that day. And I thought, well, you could see Paul come walking up there. There would be Tychicus coming up there, and there's Onesimus, and there's Tarchus, and Epaphras. All these fellows, they were Christians, God's man back yonder in the first century. Now, the interesting thing is this. Paul had never been to Rome. Paul had never been to Colossae. And yet, he gives a list of people here that he knew, and many of them from these two places. And it reveals that Paul had led many people to Christ in cities that he never visited. His ministry was a tremendous ministry. Now, I'm going to call the roll of these folk here. Let's go down hurriedly. He says, Verse 7, "...all my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord." Now, we have here first this man Tychicus. And he was one of those that was there. He was pastor of the church in Ephesus. We've talked about him before. A wonderful brother in the Lord. Then verse 9, "...with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother." Now, Onesimus was a slave of Philemon in Colossae, and he was being sent back by Paul, who had led him to the Lord, back to his master. Now, he'd run away to Rome, and Paul, having led him to Christ, now he sends him back to Philemon. But he tells Philemon, as he says here, he's a beloved brother. <laughs> and You see, in Christ, there is now a new relationship, and he's your brother now. Then we have Aristarchus. My fellow prisoner saluted you. He was a friend of Paul. He made good, and he was there with Paul. He was in prison with him. And then Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas. And you remember, Paul sent John Mark. He didn't send him back, but John Mark went back. And because of that, Paul wouldn't take him on the second missionary journey. But Paul was wrong about John Mark. He made good. And Paul here acknowledges it. He says, "...touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Don't do like I did. You receive him." And he says in his swan song, 2 Timothy, "...he's profitable to me for the ministry. Bring him with you." Wonderful fellow. And here is Jesus, which is called Justice. And the name in Hebrew was, of course, Joshua, who are of the circumcision. There were few, you see, Israelites... Jews in the Colossian church, but not many, mostly a Gentile church. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. These are wonderful brethren, you see. They were Paul's helpers and great missionaries themselves. Now he goes on to some more. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, Epaphras was the pastor in Colossae, but he's in prison. And so he has a new ministry. He is praying now. I told a young preacher that's paralyzed, and he can't preach anymore. And he just wrote a most discouraging letter. And I wrote and told him, I said, I have a job for you. Pray for me. 
that is a ministry today. Pray for God's servants. If he takes you out of active service, it means he's got something else for you to do. He says, For I bear him record that he hath a zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. These three cities were actually very close together. Hierapolis and Laodicea are very close together. Some say six miles, others ten miles. Didn't seem to me like it was very far. I've been to both places, but I didn't get over to Colossae. And these churches were in these different places. Now he says, Luke, the beloved physician. Isn't that a wonderful designation for him? Dr. Luke, he's the beloved physician. And Demas greets you. Wish I could talk a little about Demas, but we're going to talk about him later. Paul, when he first mentions him, he says, he's my fellow worker. And here all he calls him is just Demas. Paul's not sure about him here. A little later on, he forsakes him. How tragic. Now he says, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. You see, there were great heathen temples, but the church at this time meant in homes. I used to hold this viewpoint, and I still do, but I don't emphasize it today like I did one time. The church started in the home. I believe it's going to come back to the home. Now, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now, this is not an epistle to Laodicea, but it's an epistle that they had read, and it apparently was being circulated. Now, a great many of the scholars believe that that is the epistle of the Ephesians that we have today, and that it was at this time in Laodicea over in the area where Hierapolis and also the Colossians could have it also. Now he says, "...and say to Archippus, take heed." Now, here's another fellow here, and his name is Archippus. Now, what do we know about Archippus? Well, very frankly, we don't know too much about him other than what Paul tells us here. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, here is a man that had a gift, and Paul is urging him to use that gift. Now, listen to Paul. "...the salutation by the hand of me, Paul." Now, Paul dictated most of his letters. The one to the Galatians, he wrote himself. And here, Paul signs it, you see. He says to them, this is the second time, "...remember my bonds, pray for me," he says. "...grace be with you. Amen." Isn't this a glorious, wonderful little letter that we've had here? Paul wrote to a church. He had never visited the church, but he knew the church because he led most of them there to the Lord. In fact, Philemon had a church in his house in Colossae. Next time we go back to the Old Testament, begin a new section of the Old Testament, prophecy, the book of Isaiah. 